Hello everyone, my name is Nastasia and we are going to be talking about birth control today. For those of you who follow me on Instagram and have seen my Instagram stories, y'all know that I've been in the research phase for about a month, month and a half, somewhere around there. This is where I primarily spent most of my free time. I mean, as you guys know, most of my time is spent on this amazing social fitness app called Core Circle, but my free time is spent doing really cool things. Like I, I love my free time because I could dive deep into these sorts of things. And so birth control, as we all know, affects most women. Most women have taken birth control at some point in their lives. And there are millions of women who currently take birth control. And what is the most mind boggling thing is that most women don't really understand what the birth control does to their bodies and how it affects their hormones. Um, and how that might affect their romantic relationships, those who they are attracted to, just their everyday behavior, something small, something's large. And I have my concerns, if I'm being honest. Um, I have my concerns, which we'll talk about later in this video, like near the end of this video. Um, but really the main purpose of this video is to inform you all on what birth control does to your body and how it could potentially affect you in your everyday life. I do want to share with you the amazing book I pulled most of my knowledge from. This is Your Brain on Birth Control by Sarah E. Hill. You guys, she's the bomb.com. This book is so incredibly helpful and I really recommend it. Um, Sarah goes into not just what it might do to you, but like what it literally does to your hormones. So if you want to understand how it all works from a technical point of view, this is the book for that. I will also be pulling a teeny, teeny bit from this book, Beyond the Pill. She primarily talks about post birth control syndrome, which are basically the consequences or the side effects you might get after you stop taking the birth control pill. So we'll mention a little bit from there. And if you guys have, if, if you ladies have um, struggled with any post birth control syndrome, then this is the book for you. It talks about like rebalancing your hormones the holistic way, because that's the best way. First, I'm gonna give you a quick summary of my main talking points. And I have my computer here with me. So I'm first going to give you a quick summary on your hormones. Then I'm going to give you a quick summary on women's attraction to men. And then we're going to talk about what is the birth control pill? What does it do? And why do women take it? Then we're going to go into the side effects of birth control. And there are many. Um, those of you who are on birth control, I'm sure you know this. Then we're going to talk about something very important, which is birth control's impact on society, both the positive and the negative. Are you ready? Because I am ready. I, you guys, like I said, I've been doing this for a long time. So now it's time to finally pull the plug and uh, tell you guys more about birth control. So let's get into this. All right, we are going to first go into a quick summary of your hormones and also your menstrual cycle. So this is a very big thing. There's two things I'm going to mention. One, I know a lot of people like to discredit biology. It literally dictates everything. And so we're going to be primarily talking about sex hormones in this case, of course. How can we not? I mean, this is, it is what birth control affects. A lot of who you are is both nature and nurture and the nature part cannot be dismissed. So there's that. Your hormones are what make you, you. They coordinate basically everything your body does. So your sex hormones influence how you think, how you feel, how you see the world, how you behave, how you look, how you smell, the excitability of your brain cells, what your immune system does, who you are attracted to, how much you eat, and even how fertile you are. There's a lot more things. And here are some of the things your hormones are responsible for. Digestion, metabolism, sensory perception, sleep, respiration, lactation, stress, growth, development, sex, childbirth, menstrual cycle, and your mood. Those are some of the common things uh, the hormones are in charge of. And so for women, our primary sex hormones is progesterone and estrogen. And then for a man, of course, their main sex hormone is testosterone. Women have testosterone as well, but of course, in less quantities. Men also have estrogen, but of course, in less quantities. So now we are going to talk about the menstrual cycle. There are two halves in a menstrual cycle. You have the follicular phase and you have the luteal phase. 
And before we get into it, I just want to note that literally I was never taught this in school. Nobody ever taught me anything about this. And that is the case for most people today. In order to actually learn about this, you kind of have to self-educate, which is very sad because in middle school, you go through sex education, but they don't teach women this. And in high school, neither does this get talked about. Um, and it's just dismissed as a whole, I think. And whenever you have problems arising, as most people do at some point in their lives, well, of course the solution your doctors will give you to any kind of like bodily issues is birth control, <laughs> which is stupid to say the least. But anyways, back to the menstrual cycle. So you have two halves. You have the first one, the follicular phase. The second half is the luteal phase. And so the follicular phase is the conception phase. It starts on day one when you get your period and continues until an egg is released at ovulation. And ovulation usually occurs anywhere between day 10 to day 14 of your cycle. So if you didn't know this, your menstrual cycle day one technically starts on the first day of your period. I had no idea about this. Literally, I just thought the menstrual cycle was you bleed and you're done. That's it. <laughs> you bleed and you, you stick a tampon up there or you put a pad on your underwear and that's kind of it. But there's so much more and I shame the system for not teaching us any of this. It is a shame. So the fun part about the follicular, follicular phase and the hormone that takes the stage is estrogen. Estrogen increases during this phase, peaking just prior to ovulation with the release of a mature egg. The days leading up to ovulation and on ovulation, women generally may feel more flirty. They may feel like going out more. They might feel more social. They might do their makeup a different way. Perhaps they'll wear more kind of like sexier clothing, let's say. Um, and so that matters because estrogen is what is causing all of those sorts of things. And this is happening for an evolutionary reason. Women's sexual desire is the highest during this time because conception is possible, okay? Mother Nature wants women to find a mate and reproduce with them to pass on the genetic lineage. That's why you feel more flirty and more horny, I guess, um, the five-ish days leading up to ovulation and on ovulation day. And that's when women can get pregnant. You cannot get pregnant on any at any other point in your menstrual cycle. This is also something that weirdly does not get talked about. And even I use a, a period app called Flow and on the days where I'm in my luteal cycle, it always tells me low chances of getting pregnant. And it's like, there's no chance of getting pregnant. You cannot get pregnant every day out of your menstrual cycle. It's only the days leading up to ovulation on ovulation day and at a day after ovulation. That is when you are most fertile. And so I don't know why apps say this. It might be because of liability issues. It might also be because not everyone's menstrual cycle follows a 28, like 29 average day span. 28 days is about their average amount of time uh, the woman goes through her menstrual cycle. And of course, depending on your hormone balance, um, it might be shorter, it might be longer. If it is shorter, if it is longer, would recommend to get your hormone levels checked out because you might not have them at optimal levels. So research also finds that women feel sexier, are more open to new experiences and put more effort into their appearance at high fertility than at low fertility across the cycle. Women at high fertility also wore more makeup, wear sexier clothes and wear more red. Now I'm actually, <laughs> I'm actually, on my luteal phase right now. So this is not true right now for me. I just like this color and wanted to make a little statement. So that's what that's, I'm not signaling to you that I'm ovulating. <laughs> so all of this makes sense evolutionary wise. So TLDR, the average follicular phase lasts from day one to day 14, somewhere around there. And then you enter your luteal phase after you ovulate, okay? So the day after you ovulate, that's when you start your luteal phase. And this is the implantation phase of your cycle. It starts right after ovulation. And the main purpose of it is to prepare your uterus for a possible pregnancy. Honestly, learning about all this, I'm like, our bodies are so 
effing cool. So what happens is that there's a temporary endocrine structure called the corpus luteum, which is formed in the newly vacated egg follicle. And its job is to produce progesterone. Progesterone takes the stage in the luteal phase, okay? So your progesterone levels rise and they steadily rise across the later half of the cycle and generally peak somewhere near days 20 through 22. Now, what does this hormone do? It tends to make women feel hungrier, sleepier, and more relaxed than normal. It can also lead to an increase in irritability and the desire to be left alone. Some of these I have certainly, actually all of these I have certainly experienced. So Sarah says in the book, progesterone makes women feel like doing the kinds of things that help get their bodies ready for the possibility of needing to grow another human being. So here are some of the things that happen um, during the increase in your progesterone. So one, it prepares your uterine lining for pregnancy by making the lining thicker. The thick lining is the ideal environment for a fertilized egg to implant or attach and for a pregnancy to happen. So this also causes your cervical mucus to thicken into a paste. The thickened mucus helps prevent bacteria from getting inside your uterus. This is why you'll notice a different texture and consistency in your discharge. So when you're at your luteal phase and the luteal phase of your cycle, maybe more thick, dry, and paste-like, whereas during your ovulation, your discharge might be wet and slippery, kind of like the feeling of egg whites. So I'm sure most of you women have noticed that your discharge is different at different points of your cycle, and this happens for a reason. During this phase of your cycle, the luteal phase, an egg travels from your ovary through your fallopian tube into your uterus. If sperm fertilizes that egg, which by the way, fun fact, sperm can um, live in your body for I think five-ish days, somewhere around there. Hold on, let me make sure. Um, how long can sperm live inside the body? I need to make, I need to make sure, five days. Five days and a woman's egg, I think, lasts 24 hours. So this is why it's important that if you are planning to get pregnant, if you want to get pregnant, if you want to conceive, to do it on the days leading up to your ovulation, on ovulation day, or like the day after. Those like six-ish, five to six-ish days. So if sperm fertilizes that egg, the fertilized egg implants into your uterine lining and pregnancy occurs. Now, if that doesn't happen, if the egg isn't fertilized or doesn't implant, pregnancy doesn't occur, the corpus luteum dissolves, and your progesterone levels will drop, which triggers your period. During your period is when you shed your uterine lining. Now your luteal phase is over when your period has started, and the menstrual cycle restarts again. So like I said, when you get your period, that is day one of the menstrual cycle. Hopefully that gives you a quick summary on how your hormones work during your follicular phase and your luteal phase. Now we are going to go into women's attraction to men. This is super interesting. So buckle up you guys. For evolutionary reasons, you're trying to pick the best man to reproduce with. The man with the best genes is most attractive to you for a reason. Now, before the birth control pill, which made its popular mass appearance in 1960. Before that, let's think way, 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 way before that. Let's think hunter and gatherer times, tens of thousands of years ago, right? If a woman has sex with a man on the days where she is at her like highest fertility, well, she gets pregnant. And then what happens after that? You have to carry a child in your womb for nine months. That is a major investment. And after that, of course, you have to birth the child and make sure that the child is provided for and that it survives ultimately. And so when a woman is picking a man to reproduce with, that matters a lot who she chooses. At the end of the day, he needs to be able to provide. Otherwise that woman is screwed. That's why over time we've developed our like choosiness and pickiness over what men we are attracted to and what men we are not attracted to. This is for good reason. This is why women might find taller men more attractive. In fact, most women find taller men more attractive. Um, and this is something that we will call a indirect 
fitness benefits. So there's indirect fitness benefits and um, there are direct fitness benefits. So let's first talk about the direct fitness benefits. This has to do more so with like longer term relationships. And this has to do with the man's like resource investment and his caregiving qualities. So one big case is like a man's ability to provide. Is he financially secure? Um, and then there's the caregiving qualities. You could think about kind of like fatherly like qualities where he could guarantee that um, his wife and his child or children will um, receive love, care, affection and effort. So those are kind of like direct fitness benefits. And um, I wanna quickly talk about resource investment because I think this is why women want men to pay for the first date. And this is a topic I'm very passionate about. It will get heated if I'm talking to someone who does not share the same um, kind of belief as I do when it comes to who should pay on the first dates and the dates going forward. And I'm very much into the man needs to pay for the first date and the dates onwards. But we'll talk about that a little bit later, honestly. But this is a great example as to why women want most women want men to pay for the first date. It has to do with this resource investment because if the man does not pay the first date, 99.9% .9 of the time, there will not be a second date. That woman is just like, I, if he can't provide a meal for me, how could he provide for myself or for my future family, right? Um, so those things matter a lot. This is why women are picky when it comes to men and where they stand financially. So we're kind of dealing with a concept or like a phrase called chads versus dads. What I just described to you, the caregiving qualities and the resource investment has to do with dad-like qualities. And now we have more of the chad-like qualities, which are called the indirect fitness benefits. And these relate more to higher quality genes. They're more related to the sex appeal and they're more related to short term mating. So these are genetic benefits a woman can give her child by choosing to mate with a partner who has the type of genes that promote healthy surviving offspring. So, and I quote uh, from, from uh, this is your brain on birth control book, tall symmetrical men with deep voices, ambition and confidence cause our brain to produce beautiful fireworks that make us feel good because these qualities provide cues to things like health and developmental stability, which create more successful pregnancies and healthier children. Women prefer the scent of men who are socially dominant and have symmetrical faces. Women prefer men with these traits in their fertile points, their follicular phase, versus their non-fertile points in their cycle, which is their luteal phase. So you are not shallow for liking tall men. This has its evolutionary benefits and it's not a coincidence that most women like tall men. And it's not a coincidence why most women care about a man's financial stability, okay? So this is where things get a little bit interesting. Because while a woman can find a man highly attractive, he might not have the resources that prove that he's a good partner, the resources or the intelligence to prove he's a good long-term partner. And of course, women can't raise children comfortably with a man who can't provide. And attractiveness only gets women so far. It's fine for short-term mating strategies, but for long term, it just it doesn't really matter that much. Unfortunately, the reality of finding a man who is objectively attractive and who's also a family man and can provide for that woman and the future family is really, really low. These types of men are like the unicorns of the world. And guess what? Women want both. The ideal type of guy is uh, is a guy who has both of those things going on for him. And unfortunately, that's just very low. Um, and this is the type of guy I guess modern day society would call a high value man. I think that's what uh, that's what you'd call it. So that's a very rare breed, just as it's a rare breed of high value women as well. And the funny thing is that the men who, let's call them high value men, tend to have some commitment issues or they're prone to have commitment issues simply because more women 
are attracted to them and they have a lot of options to choose from. This is where it's really funny. So experiments with songbirds find that when you manipulate the male's appearance to make them irresistibly sexy to females, the males respond to the subsequent increase in female attention by decreasing their investment in their existing mate and clutch of hatchlings. And when the opposite is done and the males are manipulated to be less desirable to females, the males make up for their diminished sexiness by upping their parenting game and being more caring to their female partners. In a nutshell, it's saying that the male songbirds who are manipulated to be more attractive obviously gained a lot more attention from the female songbirds. And then as a result, they decrease their investment in their existing mate and their hatchlings. And the male songbirds who are manipulated to be, I guess, less desirable to females, less attractive, up their parenting game and um, up their kind of like caregiving qualities um, to their female partners. So I'd like to give a thank you to all of our ancestors for because of their choosiness and mates, they have formulated our likes and dislikes for men. So thanks to evolution for that. Now we could move on and talk about the birth control pill. Finally, I feel like we're talking a lot here. There's so much information, but um, I would say we're like kind of halfway done. All right. What is the birth control pill? What does it do? And why do women take it? So in 1960, the first oral contraceptive was approved by the US Food and Drug Administration, which is often called the FDA. So naturally cycling women's hormones change on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. Naturally cycle meaning women who are off of birth control. On birth control, women experience the same hormones every day. It's kind of like hormonal deja vu. That's what Sarah Hill calls it. There are certain hormones called the FSH and the LH hormone. FSH stands for uh, follicle stimulating hormone. LH is luteinizing hormone. Um, Because these are not being released in quantity, this prevents ovulation from happening. So that is what the birth control pill does. It prevents women from ovulating. So as a result, women then don't experience that increase in estrogen. No ovulation means you can't get pregnant. So there's a bunch of birth control pills out there. I believe the majority of birth control pill takers um, take the combination pill, which is the mix of the synthetic estrogen and synthetic progestin. So now we are going to go into why women take the birth control pill, and it's not to just prevent pregnancy, although that's probably the number one reason why birth control is used. So you have other things such as um, menstrual cramps and pain, irregular periods or period problems, acne, endometriosis, headache and migraine relief, abnormal hair growth or loss, PMS, which stands for premenstrual syndrome, PMDD, which stands for premenstrual dysphoric disorder, mood swings, mood disorders like anxiety and depression, unspecified hormonal symptoms, And I think those are all of the most common reasons as to why women take birth control now. It is very, very, very important to note, and I quote from Sarah Hill, most women who take the pill do so for a very targeted effect, which is to prevent pregnancy, or they take it for a small handful of other targeted effects like having clear skin, less cramps, etc. But targeted effects aren't possible when taking a hormone, especially a sex hormone. You'll get the desired effect, you know, preventing pregnancy, clear acne, whatever it is, but the effects are not targeted. The hormones in birth control are picked up by all the cells in the body that have sex hormone receptors. This means they influence the activities of billions of cells in your body at once. This is very important to note and um, very important because we're going to go into some of the side effects women have on the birth control pill. This is probably going to be the lengthier section of this video because there's so many things we wanna go into. And some of the most important things we'll talk about is your sex drive, AKA your libido. We'll talk about the mood swings and we'll talk about how your uh, level of attraction in men changes when on the birth control pill. Shockingly enough, this is again, all very interesting stuff. So, okay. Here I'm going to name out some of these side effects of birth control. Low libido, AKA low sex drive, nausea, headaches or migraines, period loss, breast tenderness or enlargement, hair loss, depression or anxiety, mood swings, 
weight gain, brain fog, you can be more prone to yeast infections, different level, uh, different attraction levels. And then we go into the more severe ones, blood clots, high blood pressure, liver tumors, increased chance of breast cancer, increased chance of cervical cancer, and potentially a chance of decrease in fertility. Now we're first going to talk about how the birth control pill may influence who you are attracted to. This is more of the interesting part of the um, video. So I'm going to give you an example of a story Sarah Hill talks about um, in this book. In fact, I'm going to give you two stories. So it is story time, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, guys. I am ready for story time. Okay. Olivia is a 35 year old attorney who has been married for 10 years. She met her husband in law school and married him a few years later. At the time she met him, she was on the pill and she had been since her senior year in college. Although her relationship with her husband had never been intensely passionate, she never felt it needed to be. She actually prided herself on the fact that she was no longer distracted by men and sex the same way she had been in her college years. She was very focused on her career and felt like she couldn't be bothered by the types of intensely sexual relationships that she'd had earlier. She had sex with her husband regularly, but she was indifferent about it. She didn't spend time thinking about sex and she regularly told her girlfriends that she could never have sex again and it wouldn't bother her at all. She felt like she had moved beyond the whims of attraction and desire, both of which took up a lot of her mental energy when she was younger. She went off the pill after the birth of their first and only child when her husband had a vasectomy. And although she didn't feel different at first, she began to notice that she was thinking about sex a lot more frequently than she used to. More startlingly, she found that she was thinking about sex with men who were not her husband. She was finding herself sexually attracted to men she met when traveling for work and while at the park with her son. She remembers vividly when it struck her that something was going on and she quotes, I was on a plane to LA to give a presentation. As I was walking through the first class cabin, I found myself making eye contact with some of the attractive men in suits who are sitting there looking so sexy and self-assured. This is when I knew that I was in big trouble. I felt like the sexual tigress and it was so startling to me. I wondered whether everything that I thought to be true about me in the last decade was a lie. Now we end off with, soon after that, Olivia began to question her relationship with her husband because she was now having all these feelings for other men, feelings that she never had for her husband. She wondered whether maybe she just married the wrong man. She thought for so long that she was just totally past all of the messiness um, of sexual desire, but she started to realize that these feelings had just been buried by what? What were these feelings buried by? The pill. They were buried by the pill. Her desire for her partner remained flat, which soon she remedied by getting involved in a sexual relationship with an attractive man she met at a party. She suspected that going off the pill may have played a role in her desire reawakening. And because of this, she continues to toy with the idea of going back, blah, 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 blah. So you get the story here and I will summarize it super quickly for you. The woman was in a relationship. I believe she met the man when she was on the pill and she, later on, you know, she had children, she had all of that. Um, and then she got off of the pill. When she got off of the pill, she noticed she was starting to gain an attraction to other men. She was thinking about sex a lot more frequently and they weren't sexual fantasies about her husband. They were sexual fantasies about other men. So she kind of had like a wandering eye for other men and she wasn't as interested. She wasn't as kind of like sexually attracted to her man. And so as a result of that, she came into her temptations and had an affair. So that is the story of Miss Olivia. Now there's another story that I will not go into. I'll just quickly summarize. It's a, it's a story from a 23-year-old uh, girl named Annalise. And I'll just, again, give you a little quick summary about it. Um, Annalise started taking the birth control pill when she was 17 years old. Um, sometime in college is when she got into a long-distance relationship. 
Long story short, this woman got off of birth control and she came to visit her husband and, I'm oh, sorry, she came to visit her boyfriend and all of a sudden she was incredibly disgusted by the smell of her boyfriend and her boyfriend's dog. She was no longer attracted to her boyfriend anymore. Um, and so she broke up with him because of that. And another interesting thing in her story was that before she went on the pill, she was interested in all sorts of things like shopping, doing her makeup, doing her hair and even exercise. And when she got on the pill, it's like that was completely gone from her life. She just felt no desire or felt a need or a want to even do those sorts of things. And so when she got off of the pill, that's when, okay, she broke up with her boyfriend. Um, and that's when she also got back into exercise, got back into shopping more, got back into doing her makeup. So just two interesting stories for you guys to think about and reflect on, as I'm sure some of these things are relevant to some of the women watching this video. Okay, so we've talked about women's attraction to different types of men earlier. You have the indirect fitness benefits, which are kind of like the objectively masculine traits, qualities. And then you have the direct fitness benefits, which are more so the caregiving qualities and a man's ability to provide. And then we talked about how the five-ish days leading up to a woman's ov ovulation and the day of leads to an estrogen increase and how she may feel more flirty, more outgoing, more social, all of these sorts of things, and more attracted to men who have those objectively masculine traits. But there's two things that the birth control pill does. One, it stops a woman from ovulating. Two, your brain thinks that you're on the progesterone dominant luteal phase of your cycle. Now we'll get into why that is important. The cat is out of the bag. There were multiple studies done that showed women on birth control have a preference for men with less masculine faces and voices. Because this is something that women prefer during the second half of their cycle when progesterone is high, because just what I said like 20 seconds ago, woman's brain thinks that she's in the progesterone dominant luteal phase of her cycle. Now there were a couple of studies done that showed this, a couple I will go into. There was a study done that wanted to test whether women on the birth control pill chose men with less, less masculine features than the women who were off of the birth control pill. They recruited a large sample of men who were in relationships. Half of the men were chosen by women off the pill and the other half of men were chosen by women on the pill. The researchers took the men's photographs so that they could compare the masculine differences on both a subjective and objective level. Um, subjective meaning uh, how masculine their faces looked to outside uh, readers and objective meaning the calculations they used to assess like cheekbone prominence, the ratio of jaw height to lower face height and the ratio of face height to width. So can you guess the results of this study? I will tell you. The men chosen by pill taking women had significantly less masculine faces than those men chosen by non pill taking women. Interesting things. Now there's another study that I want to quickly go into. Um, we are going to go into which qualities pill taking and non pill taking women had greater satisfaction with from their partners. So researchers conducted a survey of relationship quality on a sample of more than 2000 women, each of whom had at least one child. Half of the women were on the pill when they met their partners, half were not. The survey asked women questions about the quality of the relationship with the man who fathered their first child, regardless if um, they were still in that relationship. The results will be shown somewhere up here in this video. The two white items are those areas of relationship satisfaction that were greater for the women who chose their partners um, on the pill rather than off. And so you can see here that the partner's financial provisioning and the partner's intelligence were of greater satisfaction with women who were on the pill as opposed to women who were off the pill. That is interesting. 
the light gray areas show aspects of relationship satisfaction that were higher for women who met their partners off of the pill. You have sexual arousal, sexual adventurousness, sexual perceptivity, sexual attraction, partner support, and partner's body attractiveness. So that is very interesting. You have that. And then we have the dark gray items, uh, which are the aspects of the relationship satisfaction that didn't differ between pill takers and non-pill takers. So you have orgasm with partner, partner's loyalty, partner's ambition, partner rejection, compliant sex, and partner's facial attractiveness. Now what's interesting is that a partner's facial attractiveness, there's no difference in satisfaction between a woman who's on the pill and off the pill. But with the partner's body attractiveness, women who met their partners off of the pill had greater satisfaction than women who were on the pill. Another thing to note is that uh, a pattern that was observed in the study was that women who chose their partners when they were on the pill were significantly less likely to divorce than men who chose their partners when they were off the pill. Um, and I think this just maybe, I have some um, thoughts on why that has to do with that pattern. Kind of what I said near the beginning of the video, the attractiveness and the sexiness of a man can only get a woman so far. It's good for like sexual purposes and again for, I guess, higher genetic quality of your offspring. But at the same time, when you're thinking about settling down with a man, these things don't take the high seat. What takes the high seat is the man's ability to provide for you. Now, of course, attractiveness does matter. These things do matter because we all know that, you know, I'm sure you've heard married couples say that like an important thing to a high quality marriage is having high quality sex, right? And so if you're not sexually aroused by your partner or just like not as much, then definitely that compromises, compromises on your sex life and that has the potential um, to transform into something else, meaning perhaps cheating on your partner to get that sexual satisfaction from someone who uh, uh, has the qualities of a Chad, let's say. Someone who um, has high indirect fitness benefits. <laughs> So that makes sense. When there's, you know, when there's marriage involved, there's kids involved, you want your man to provide. Um, and so if that doesn't happen, then it's like looks can only get you so far. The most interesting thing to me is when women on the pill get into relationships with men. And if those men, let's say, are objectively not that attractive, like they're mediocre looking, let's say, um, when those women get off of the pill, they tend to be less attracted to that guy. I mean, like I said in the two stories I I talked about, there was a girl named Annalise who was literally disgusted by the scent of her boyfriend after she got off the pill. And in the story of uh, the other woman, I forgot her name, the older one, she literally cheated on her husband to get the sexual satisfaction her, um, I don't know, biological side needed. I need a water break. Coffee. Okay, so when I was scrolling through Reddit, um, I think specifically it was the birth control forum. I actually saw a few men post in there and I was shocked. Here is a screenshot of a Reddit post I came across. The subject line goes, girlfriend has intense mood swings and almost broke up with me after quitting birth control help question mark. And it reads, um, hello, I am a 27 year old man and I have a girlfriend who's 23 years old who has PCOS, which stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome. And about a month ago, had her next planon, next planon, next removed. When we met, she was on it. Key part right there. After coming off, we were fighting a lot. She tells me that ever since stopping, she has bitterness towards me and she does not know why. Tonight, she asked me if I thought we were settling for each other because we have the same goals and we are not the right partner for each other in certain situations. She then says something about settling as in we could be happy or happier with other people. She also confides she's falling out of love with me. 
Now, two hours later, she's apologizing, saying it's hormones and that she's noticed intense mood swings since stopping it. She says this is a pattern as she did it with her last boyfriend a few years ago when she came off birth control. Now this poor man is saying, my question is, is this normal in all caps i feel like i'm losing my mind over here not knowing which extreme she'll be at now this is a sad scenario for both the man and the woman i can't imagine what that man's going through because i'm sure i mean this guy had made the effort of posting this reddit thread i'm sure he's a caring boyfriend but now that the girlfriend has um stopped taking birth control she's experiencing these crazy mood swings now can she be experiencing a loss of attraction for her boyfriend Perhaps. It was not mentioned in this uh, Reddit thread, but it is not unlikely. And when you think about it, it's like, well, I don't think women would generally feel comfortable telling their boyfriends like, hey, I'm losing sexual attraction for you or like you're not as attractive. Instead, they will say things such as they are my mood swings and it's caused by, you know, getting off the birth control pill. But regardless of what the real why is of this. It's not like you just stop taking something and you get back to normal. There are most likely some consequences, especially if you are in a relationship. Now, I do know that um, if you do have an objectively like attractive man, let's say, you know, objectively attractive has those objectively masculine traits, um, and you met him on your birth on the birth control pill and let's say you got off of the birth control pill then your attraction levels towards him don't change in fact they increase so this is where my first piece of advice comes from i think the most reasonable thing to do is um to not take the birth control pill to stop taking the birth control pill just like not take it at all when you are um, in the dating stages uh, with people. Perhaps you're dating around, seeing who's a good fit for you, or uh, perhaps you're like unsure about this guy and you want to be extra sure about him. So like, make sure you're not on the birth control pill so it does not mess up your attraction uh, levels towards this man or whatever man you, you whatever man you are uh, looking to date. Is the last thing you want is to go through a story like Annalise had or to go through a story that other women in the marriage had. It's a complete waste of time, in my opinion, um, to, to date someone and then to get off the birth control pill and later find out that, oh, you know, I'm not attracted to this man anymore. I'm going to break up with him. Um, so if you know better, which now you know, now we could do better. And that is the greatness of being informed. Next thing I want to talk about is how the birth control pill affects a woman's sex drive. These are um, the more popular topics and concerns I've seen through Reddit is, is women complaining about their low sex drive and their low libido. And when I was listening to a podcast, um, there were three women in that podcast. One of them was talking about her wedding day story. And I think this couple are Christian. So they were waiting to have sex with each other until the wedding day. I believe it was one of those things. And so the woman was like, well, I want to, after, you know, my wedding day, I want to be sexually active with, with my new husband. And, um, then the wedding day comes and the honeymoon comes and she, she had like no sexual arousal. Um, she did not want to have sex with her husband at all. I can't imagine the thoughts that are coming through her head. She's probably thinking, what is wrong with me? Why don't I have the desire to have sex with my new husband? And so what ended up happening is she cried on her wedding day. And that's a, a very, very sad thing. And months later, she realized it wasn't because there was something wrong with her. It was because she was taking the birth control pill. And so she ended up getting off of the birth control pill and I think doing something, either it was like the pull-out method or and or the fertility awareness method, which by the way, does not get talked about. We'll talk about it a little bit near the end. Um, so she started doing that, got off of birth control, right? And um, great, everything kind of went back to almost normal. Now she did talk about how she still has not regained the same amount of like, sexual arousalness or like desire that she had before taking the birth control pill. I know, um, I think in this book it talks about how you might not like regain your sex drive the same way it was before um, you took the birth control pill. It might take some time for it to come back to normal. So that's something to um, certainly 
consider. There's plenty of research that backs the idea of one, women are less interested in sex, and two, women have sex less frequently and are more likely to have uh, problems with pain or discomfort from sex. And I think that might, that pain and discomfort might come from um, just not enough lubrication down there. And women's mating efforts might also decrease as well. Can be like the use of cosmetics, like the clothing of choice, or dieting, exercise, even like the use of tan beds um, and all of those sorts of things. Uh, research has shown that those interests are decreased when on the birth control pill. There's also a lot of research about women's free testosterone levels taking a steep decline as well. Most research finds that pill takers levels of free T, free testosterone, are somewhere on the order of 61% lower than those of non pill taking women. Now that is an interesting one because um, your uh, testosterone does rise, I believe like around the time when your estrogen rises, so in your follicular phase. So yeah, your T levels drop and uh, that might be why you have low libido. So there's that for sex drive. And the last thing we'll talk about is mood because this is a very important thing um, to talk about when it comes to birth control. This is another popular topic I have seen um, on those Reddit threads. Almost half of the women who go on the pill stop using it within the first year because of intolerable side effects. And the most frequently cited ones are anxiety, depression, or both. Researchers found that women who were on hormonal contraceptives were 50% more likely to be diagnosed with depression six months later compared with women who weren't prescribed um, hormonal contraceptives during this time. They also found that the women who were on hormonal contraceptives are 40% more likely to be prescribed an antidepressant than women who were not. Women who were hit the hardest were between the ages of 15 to 19. Um, and this seems to be most potent, uh, the likeliness for depression, um, for non-oral products like the patch, the vaginal ring, um, or the hormonal IUD. Now, Researchers also found that women who were on hormonal contraceptives were twice as likely to have attempted suicide than non-pill-taking women. Risk of successful suicide attempts were actually higher, and it was triple that of women who were not on um, hormonal contraceptives. Now, that is very stark. Um, that, that, that's very sad. Um, according to research, you might have a greater risk of experiencing negative mood effects on the pill if you have a history of depression or mental illness, you have personal family history of mood related side effects on the birth control pill, you are taking progestin only pills, you are using a non oral product, you are taking a multiphasic pill, or you are 19 or younger. So that's important to know. And um, perhaps when you go to the doctor's office and, or when you tell those who are close to you about this and they might label you. I don't know, crazy or say that, you know, it's just a phase or say, or like do say anything to invalidate your feelings. Um, this is a very serious thing. And a lot of people do not understand that their mood swings are likely caused by the birth control pill. Um, and so first of all, your feelings are very much validated. Um, and if your doctor kind of tells you otherwise, then it's time to find another doctor who actually understands. And there are a lot of doctors who are men. And so uh, they might just generally feel less empathetic towards uh, a case like this. And they just might not understand it the best way a female doctor can, perhaps not the case for all the time. So you might not be crazy. It might just be the birth control pill you are on. Um, now, I do also want to mention that there are women out there who take the birth control pill who do not experience these side effects. Um, and that's very important to talk about as well, because, you know, there are women who don't suffer from low libido or mood swings or any of that nature. I think if you are having some crazy side effects and you want to stay on the birth control pill, um, maybe it just takes finding other brands of birth control. So that also matters a lot. But on the topic of like mood swings and overall just like side effects, the topic of quality of life comes to mind. I mean, I believe that our health and our fulfillment uh, are the two most important things in life. And so if taking something that compromises either one of those things um, 
you you may ask yourself like i'd ask myself like is it really worth it is it really worth it especially if there are other options out there it's it's all situational at the end of the day i can't give blanket advice but the only thing i'll say is i'd, I'd heavily uh consider if the pros outweigh the cons. The last thing I want to mention are some of the um, consequences of what Dr. Jolene Brighton talks about as post birth control syndrome. So some of the things that can happen to you after you stop taking the birth control pill include loss of menstruation, infertility, pill induced PCOS, hypothyroidism, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, gut dysfunction and autoimmune symptoms. So that is it for the little section on, or the biggest section on what the birth control is, what it does. And now we are going to go into the overall societal effects on the birth control pill because shocker, it's not something that just affects women on an individual basis. It's something that affects society at large and there are positives and there, cer there certainly are negatives. So we'll go into that right now. I guess we could start with this. Like I said near the beginning of this video, for the first time in humankind, women now have the option to not get pregnant. They have the option to sleep with whomever they want, basically have sex the way a man can have sex um, and not bear the consequences of a pregnancy. That is remarkable. Millions, if not tens of millions of women take birth control. So how can it not affect society at scale? And um, it certainly, certainly, certainly does. We'll first start off with the positive side of things. Of course, women could delay thinking about marriage and thinking about um, starting a family when they take the birth control pill. That's like basically out of the question. I mean, a woman could date around as much as she wants to. She could, she could essentially do whatever she wants, right? As a result of women being able to um, focus on career, let's say instead of, instead of marriage, instead of family, of course, women have excelled in many areas, career-wise, education-wise, um, than they have previously. So much so that women are now outpacing men in their studies and education and in the workforce. Um, which is a topic for a later video because the boys and the men of our modern day society are not doing well. They're doing very, very poor statistically. And um, I, I have a book that talks about that that I'm currently reading because this stuff is interesting. So women with high ambitions can act on it and become as successful as they want to be. And in 2017, more than 56% of college students on campus were women. That's 2.2 million more women being enrolled than men. Women are also graduating at a higher rate. We are seeing more female teachers, um, even more so than male teachers. And women are just hit, killing it and, and, and basically everything. I'm reading a book called The Global Sexual Revolution, Destruction of Freedom in the Name of Freedom by Gabrielle Ruby, Kubi, Kubi. This is a wonderful book, a really, really wonderful book. And um, you know, these past couple of months I've been questioning the hustle culture, how much women have, um, how much, I guess, modern day feminists and just women in general, like uh, let's take feminism out of it. How much women have placed um, a importance of career and that it should be um, cared about more than let's say having a family. Sure, women could uh, become more financially successful and be fully independent in that sense. And I think that's a great thing, by the way. I think being independent and making your own money is a fantastic thing, uh, with no doubt. Um, but at the same time, I feel like women have swung like one way. One way was like traditional, like stay at home mom, and now to the other way, um, where it's completely the opposite. It's women caring way more about their careers, their education, um, than literally anything else. And so that definitely has its um, negatives on society and on, on that woman. You have women, high achieving women, who hit their 30s, for example, get up to the highest point in their careers and start asking themselves a question of, what is all this for? What am I doing this for? I feel like something's missing in my life, but what is it really? They have this natural yearning for more. And more in this case is um, 
that marriage is starting that family, that is ultimately higher fulfillment. And some women will uh, listen to this and be like, absolutely not. I will never want to have kids one day. I can never, I can't stand the thought of children and family. And I would say that most of those women saying those things are brainwashed by modern day feminism. 1000%. You could argue with me. I don't care. I, I do not care. And I could give my own testimony to this. For years, I have spent most of my hours doing startup stuff, starting multiple businesses, killing it in that aspect, um, being super driven, super dedicated, all that. And then what hit me in 2022 was realizing that, hey, I want a big family. Like I, I want a lot of children. I want to get married and I want to have the large family. Like that's, that is my goal. And that I think is the highest purpose that I think that is my mission in life. Like when I get asked about my mission, I say two things. I'm like big family and make impact on the world. And that's probably primarily through like business or whatever way I do so in the next decades of my life. Um, but like the thing that strikes me with most, um, feeling and like excitement is the first one is the family aspect. And I recently have started balancing my time more with um, things like getting in tune with my femininity because over time when you become so business oriented and that's like the only thing you do, you just start kind of getting all sorts of strictly like masculine traits and you start becoming a little bit cold. And what I've noticed is that life doesn't have much joy in it, if I'm being honest. And now I'm at this point where I've realized, look, I have limited limited years on this earth. Everyone has limited years on this earth, on this planet. And um, I want to live every day the best way I can. And that has to do with seeking things, doing things that bring joy to my life. And I've been doing exactly that. So like one of the things that I've been doing a lot more is cooking and baking. And like, like I said earlier, I've never felt this much satisfaction in my life, like ever before when cooking and baking, it's, it's really, really wonderful. Like I'm telling you guys really wonderful. I want to make it absolutely clear. Of course, there are always outliers. There are women who genuinely do not want to have any kids. Um, and I mean, I can't say much about that. All I know is that there are women who genuinely don't want any kids. Like there are 50 year olds out there who are childless <clears throat> and who are completely fine with it. But there are also 50 year olds who bought into the whole feminist ideologies who are childless and who do not have a great relationship or any relationship with a man and they feel immense regret. And I'm not here to judge what anybody does, but I will say that the one thing that you should try to avoid in life is that feeling of regret because life is limited. You can't take back wasted time. Um, and so I think a lot of the younger women of this time, this generation, my generation, the Gen Z's are just completely fooling themselves into thinking that marriage and family doesn't matter and that they should focus on their careers and be these so-called girl bosses and while you could still have your own business and, and achieve your career and all of that, but you also don't have to put down marriage and family and those things that are, I think, so intrinsically important to female nature. I'm editing the video right now and I noticed that the point I originally wanted to make wasn't super clear. What I wanted to say was that you don't have to have either or. You could do both. And I think right now, kind of like what I mentioned that um, women skewed more into like the traditional household stereotype of a woman and now we're swinging the complete opposite direction which is like destruction of the nuclear family like family does not matter at all it's all all the focus should be on the career and so I think a healthy balance to a fulfillment for a majority of women not all of them but for a majority is that healthy balance and that's personally something that I am going to strive for just wanted to make that clear. Thanks. That was my little spiel. Now we're going to talk about a similar thing. This is something that I have been thinking about um, when reading about birth control, but it's something that Sarah, Sarah Hill put so incredibly well in her book. And I will quote her on this. 
Many of the things that men do are ultimately motivated by the desire to impress, court, and have sex with women. Natural selection has wired men's brains to be inspired to do things that women value. There's not much of an incentive for men to be highly ambitious if, let's say, women don't exist. Women are so motivating to men because they are the ones who get to dictate the conditions that need to be met for sex to occur. I think the men listening to this video will completely agree with that. It's kind of like the woman who um, is in charge of, you know, what happens, I guess, before um, sex happens. Again, we go into why, and the answer is, well, biology. Women, again, have to take on a nine month pregnancy and then they have to prioritize the survival of their children, uh, of the child. So it makes sense why a reproduction is way more costlier for women than it will ever be for men. Um, and this is why, again, women are picky. And so this leads me to my next point, that the more women have higher standards, the harder the men will work to be chosen. Women and men are now engaging in casual sex, in hookups. And the birth control pill obviously enables for that to happen because a woman can sleep with whomever, whom, whomever she chooses without the risk of getting pregnant. And I'm just going to say this right now. I think, I believe casual sex is more of a detriment to women than a benefit. Um, and the reason why I say that is because of the emotional damage that the woman occurs with all of her sexual encounters, uh, one night stands, hookups, all of those sorts of things. Um, I just, I mean, let me give you an example. No, let's say you've known about a guy and you, you know, you're attracted to him. You think he's cute. You guys are texting. You're in the texting stage where it's like a bit of a situationship. Let's say that's been a popular word the past couple of years. You're in a situationship with this one man. He put no effort towards you. It's been just kind of like casual, right? the past few months of you two knowing each other. Um, maybe you guys were texting like once a day or multiple times a day, or um, but there's nothing really big. The man's not buying you flowers, not asking you to be his girlfriend, not saying he's exclusive to you. So long story short, let's say you're at a party, you're at a bar and things again lead to things and you guys end up sleeping with each other. And perhaps in the back of her mind, she thinks, well, if I give him my body, then that will make him want me. That will make him want to invest in me. And then she goes back home. Let's say a day goes by and there's no text. There's no text. The man didn't even send her back in an Uber to her home. She maybe had to call the Uber herself. The woman is starting to feel shame. She's starting to feel regret. She's starting to ask, why did I give my body up to this man who did nothing? to me ultimately, who invested very little time and energy towards me. And she starts regretting it. She thought that she'd win, but she indeed lost. And that is just one of the many stories of, um, of, of, of women who engage in, in casual sex. I think it is, there's just, what's the benefit for women, right? Like, honestly, if, if, if there's somebody who's listening to this and they're pro-casual sex, please tell me in the comment section, what is a genuine benefit of women who engage in casual sex? Because the only thing that I can think about is if the sex is really, 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 really good and there's no attachments whatsoever and like no, no emotional attachments, none of that, right? Then I could understand why casual sex might be good. But either, either way, there's something called oxytocin, the love hormone, the bonding hormone, right? You have that, that gets released um, during sex and after sex. And so it like naturally bonds you in one way or in another with that person. Sorry, y'all, I had to switch out my battery because I literally drained it from 100% to 0% with all of this chit chatting, right? I think I was asking you to list me some pros of casual sex because I can't think of any genuine ones that make sense. They just don't. Our brains are wired completely differently from a man's brain. Like I said, 
throughout the entire history of humankind up until very recently, but up until 1960, which is uh, like 60 years ago, somewhere around there, up until 60 years ago, women have had to be choosy with people that they chose to reproduce with. Do you not think that that has any effect whatsoever on you, your mating strategies, how you view sex, the feelings you get after sex? Or do you think it's just, it's all in your head? Like these things are, they're societal structures. Uh, this is what, um, or societal uh, forms of oppression. That's what um, our lovely modern day feminists love to talk about. Every man walking on earth is here to just oppress you. And the bad feelings you have after engaging in hookups and casual sex is, is some form of oppression, you should get rid of it immediately uh, because women can have sex the same way men can. And I'm gonna tell you this right freaking now, that is bullshit. So that's all I'll say in terms of that. Gotta be honest with ourselves and I wanna make it absolutely clear when I'm talking about modern day feminism, I am not talking about the basic equality between a man and a woman because we all know for damn sure that women have the same equal rights as men. Where that's not what I'm talking about when it comes to modern day feminism. I'm talking to the incredibly radical side of feminism that has now permeated throughout all of Western culture. This is the same beliefs and ideologies that say women can have sex the same way guys can and that there's no binary sexual differences between a man and a woman and that women can be like men and men can be like women. Um, this is all bullshit at the end of the day. So that's where I stand in terms of that. So now we go into the level of effort, the less level of effort a man can now make when it comes to casual sex. To tie off the point that I started from, what Sarah was talking about, many of the things that men do are ultimately motivated by the desire to impress, woo, court, and ultimately sleep with a woman. And so if a woman is easier to sleep with now, if men can invest way less in a woman to get the same kind of end result, why would, would, why would men feel incentivized to achieve? And I think this plays a big role into why our modern day men are now doing worse. Worse in all aspects. I think pornography also it plays a huge, huge role in this because now instead of going outside, going out to meet a woman, um, wooing her, courting her, and ultimately getting her to bed, let's say, if we're strictly just taking it as a sexual, in, in a sexual context, men no longer have to do that. They could just lock their bedroom door, open up, you know, that site and get to work. And then they have the same kind of dopamine release. But unfortunately, pornography is incredibly addictive. And once it gets to that point, it has incredible consequences on a man's mental health, just like physical health in general, testosterone levels eventually decline. And it's, it's not great. So let's just say that our modern day society is not exactly thriving. The thing that I could end off with, since we're still on this topic, is just to be smart when it comes to these sorts of things like personal relationships, romantic relationships, um, because you may think that life could give you all the chances in the world, but life is ultimately just not fair and doesn't work that way. And we are subject to our own biology at the end of the day, no matter if we like it or not. Okay. Facts don't care about feelings. And once you learn that and accept that life will become much better. I promise you that. I hope this video leaves you with some answers on birth control and leaves you more infor informed about it. I hope it has made you think about birth control and whether you should take it or not. And um, I did also want to mention the fertility awareness method that does not get talked a lot about. In fact, it very rarely gets talked about. I've only heard it once in my life and that was through a Catholic friend who got married um, a couple years back. I believe it just includes various methods of tracking of when you are most fertile um, in your menstrual cycle and then like abstaining from sex during that time and then obviously engaging in the, the times in your cycle where you can't get pregnant. So there are other strategies out there for still having sex but not taking a hormone altering pill for it. And I think beyond the pill goes 
through that. Do your own research. I am not your doctor. I am not your mother. Okay, just think about this video as partially informative, but also partially coming from a kind of like a big sister POV point of view. And I'm just here to help you on your journey of life. Have a wonderful day. My voice is tired. I'm hungry. See ya.